desensitize yourself to failure. Like that mm. is the number one hack to success is desensitizing yourself to failure and desensitize yourself to messing up. You're gonna, you're gonna lose money. Like statistically speaking, I've lost a lot of money on projects. I've also made a lot of money on other projects because that's the way this stuff works. You're gonna do something, you're gonna hire the wrong person, you're gonna spend too much money on a photo shoot or an MVP. It's just gonna happen, okay? Mm. And the quicker that you can learn to just get over it and move on to the next thing, and like the quicker response time you have, the higher your success, the, the higher your chances of success really become. Welcome to the Undefeated Underdogs podcast, where I unpack and narrate stories of ambitious people who turn obstacles into opportunities. My goal for this podcast is to create a platform to narrate underdog stories and maybe play a small, teeny tiny role in inspiring you. I intend to highlight the underdog mentality and make authentic conversations with people who play the long game, take action with the chip on their shoulder, and convert obstacles into opportunities. Buckle up, as I'll be bringing some authentic founders, VCs, community builders, and content creators who got underestimated their whole lives and yet, they beat all the odds to become insanely successful. Now, today I want to tell you a little bit about our awesome sponsor, Acquire.com. Selling a business is as tough as building a business. As someone who went through this process once, selling my own startup, I know the pain it takes to get to the end zone. This is where our sponsor shines. Imagine this, you're a founder who's built a solid SaaS product, acquired customers and generating consistent monthly revenue. The problem is you're not growing for, for whatever reason, lack of focus, lack of skill, or just plain lack of interest, and you feel stuck. What should you do? The story I'd like to hear is you buckle down, somehow reignited the fire, get past yourself and the cliches, and start working on your business rather than just in the business. You start building an audience, move out of your comfort zone to do sales and marketing, and in six months, you triple your revenue. The reality isn't as simple. Situations may be different from every founder facing these crossroads, but too many times, the story ends up being one of inaction and stagnation until the, become business, the business becomes less valuable or worse, worthless. If you find yourself here, or your story is likely headed down a similar road, I offer you a third option. Consider selling your business on Acquire.com. Capitalizing on the value of your time is a smart move. Acquire.com is free to list and they've helped hundreds of founders already. Go to try.acquire.com slash Sharad and see for yourself if this is the right option for you. Now, let's get into today's episode. Yay, there you go. Welcome, welcome folks. Uh, Welcome to the Undefeated Underdogs podcast. I'm your host, Sharad. Today, I have a, I have a friend. I, I can call her as a friend. Uh, unlike like previous guests, I have like little touch with them or they're completely new. Most of them are like for the first time I'm having them on the podcast. You know, I'm even like meeting them. But today, I have a friend. I'm excited to bring Alex Friedman. Welcome to the show, Alex. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. For folks who don't know Alex, uh, well, I can do like a half an hour intro, but let me put it briefly in like probably like 30 seconds. Alex is a 3X startup founder. She's done, you know, so many things, but one of the uh, most notable thing is the, is founder gigs, which actually she took like what, 48 hours to build an MVP in the first month, 5k MRR, six months later, sold it to high runner. That's a phenomenal journey I want to cover and unpack. Uh, but she's currently an EAR at Techstars. She's an angel investor and an advisor to many. One of the things I really love about Alex is her authenticity. I think you, Alex brings a, 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 an angle of creativity to content, which is something very few people do and do at scale and do it at consistency. So that's one thing I personally love about her. And... The result of that is, of course, you know, throughout all her social media presence, she gained over like 150K followers in various platforms. And, you know, she's, she's always amped up about founders, early startups, you know, talking about lowlights, 
you know everybody talks about highlights but amplifying low lights and really like you know uh making it as a discussion is something i love about you alex but uh i'm excited stoked welcome to the show uh for for folks before we go ahead with the questions and all i have to tell you like a little story the first time i met alex is of course i never met her in in real life but we we, we had so many chats before and it was me when i was like looking for a job and someone tagged into a thread i wrote on twitter and alex and i jumped on a call she was building this company called howdy which went to tech stars and all but i have to tell you this for folks who know alex what a phenomenal transformational journey she had in the last two and a half three years and i've been so inspired uh by the con- constant content you put out alex so just want to put that out appreciate you so much thank you i love you for everything you do uh you know especially for founders and bringing bringing like i said uh shedding light on the low lights but just a fun question to start off yeah why do you have like a like a cowboy hat <laughs> on your twitter okay this is why so when i um when i started my twitter was when i was running howdy it was like brand new okay so oh. i I'm going to add a little cowboy hat next to my name on Twitter, right? Because like the company's Howdy. I was doing it for Howdy. Mm. And then I just kind of kept it there. I like never, I never got rid of it. A big reason why I never got rid of it is because, um, so Ryan, I don't know why I'm blanking on his last name all of a sudden. Your old boss, Ryan. Oh, (laughs) Ryan Ryan Hoover. Yeah. So Ryan Hoover came and talked at Techstars Music back in like 2018. And one mm. of the things that he said is he told a story about why he keeps his name and his his profile picture consistent on every platform, even though his profile picture is like something yeah. like, like 15 years old at this point. So this was a long yeah. time ago we telling us about this. And he's like, oh, I do it for consistency because now everybody, they know my face based off that picture. Right. And right. so um, I had the same profile picture for a very long time. I just changed my profile mm-hmm. picture for the first time, like, like two, three months ago. Mm. Uh, and I, I refused to take the cowboy hat out. <laughs> yeah, I think it's Ryan who kind of uh, made it popular that your profile picture is your brand. and. Yeah. And to add that Naval famously quoted, like, you know, every brand as a person, they have a unique resemblance to them that they expose or express <laughs> on others. Right. So I completely agree. And I've regretted so many times changing my profile picture right? and I bite my tongue like, damn, I have to remember Ryan's you know, philosophy. I agree with him so many times and I'm sticking to my profile picture for, I think, for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, I think it's. I think this guy, Ben Simmons, uh, I oh. forgot his uh, Twitter handle, whatever X handle. He's the one who said, yes, to add to what Ryan said about brand, make it playful and colorful when you add an emoji. So going back to my uh, days when I built Shoutout, I had this megaphone next to my name, you know, same way. But, uh, you know, I sold it and, you know, I just, it, it felt re- irrelevant now, but completely agree to your point of, you know, glad like, that you brought it up. I'm pro you bringing back the megaphone for the record. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do it. Yeah, I think megaphone is something that maybe I'm a more of, I amplify positivity and kind of yeah. you know, community aspect of it. Probably I'll just bring it, you know. My thing is, I'm like, well, I live in Austin. It makes sense. I'm like, mm. it's funny because people will meet me and they're like, oh, I was expecting you to have a Southern accent. I get that pretty frequently. And I was like, why? And they're like, oh, because right. you live in Texas and you have the cow- like the cowboy emoji. And I'm like, oh, whatever. It's, it's fun. <laughs> That's so fun. Uh, I think the immediate observation anybody will have if they're a new or stranger that, you know, visits, you know, your profile. Again, like I said in the intro, you kind of blend creativity and storytelling into your content. Just want to highlight some examples when, when it comes to, you know, storytelling. You recently tweeted about your, uh, your dad's you know, big mistake of make, you know, showing <laughs> his potential customer like a, 
like another option which ended up you know losing the sale uh-huh. as well as you know some of the tweets about like age comparisons you know you're you're not late you're early you know you're there is a blend of like i think you draw a sense of a lesson from a real life story talk to me about that process like how do you think when you write these tweets or when you put out content how do you find that angle it's very hard and it it requires a knack to find that angle so talk to me about that process of writing uh, tweets or anything um it's funny because a lot so a lot of my tweets are actually written on the fly like i don't use a scheduler um mm. i i write them in app and then i draft them um i have i have like a couple of those apps i've tried them i've never really done well on like scheduling or like mm. looking at other people's content for inspiration i find that i draw the most inspiration from real life and i've been raised by entrepreneurs my whole life and i know that that is like a complete privilege and then getting to work in tech stars where i was constantly also surrounded by mm. entrepreneurs of course um, there's not a lot of people that get that opportunity to sit in rooms of 50 startup founders that are building out their dreams and get to work with them intimately for for 3 months straight And mm. so a lot of the experiences I talk about online are are literally taken from real life experiences or just mm. from listening to people and hearing about issues and after a while when I mean I've probably worked with like over 1000 startup founders at this point in my career maybe more honestly um I I mean I've ran and been a part of like six or seven Techstars programs I've gone through Techstars I've invested on my own like mm-hmm. I I talk to founders and then I also make content so it just happens and so I've started to pattern match these situations or these issues that I hear from people pretty consistently and then mm-hmm. I can draw that back to a story or an instance that inspired me so whether that was a conversation with a founder whether that was a conversation with a mentor or whether that was something that like I just saw and observed growing up mm-hmm. I like to tell those stories because it's just a it's fun like it's literally just me reminiscing about them like <laughs> i love that my dad told me that story all the time cuz he hammered it home and then as i got older i mean i'm 30 i'm i turned 32 next week and i only feel like i started appreciating that story maybe maybe 3 4 years ago and mm. i think it's because up until that point i was so stubborn and being like no i know what's right people want options people want a ton of cool things right, right. and now after hearing all these stories from all these founder friends for me building unsuccessful businesses and unsuccessful projects i'm able to look at that story and say hey there's probably a lot of people out there that need to hear this same exact thing mm. and maybe i'm a good person for them to hear it from and here's a story that i can use to back it up mm i love it. i think it's uh it's again going back to your uh state of being authentic right yeah. you 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 find these lessons that apply to you and you went through it so you have that authority to like express it with command so all of the stories i i read oh my god i've read so many of tweets of your tweets and i find it very fascinating to have that uh you know like you said the pattern recognition that match the story uh, to any startup founder to like have a takeaway have you ever felt like you you ran out of stories like you're out of your fuel your gas and if yes how do you refuel it yeah it's a great question um yeah all the time i mean there's there's certain times i i get like this imposter syndrome like anybody else right, right. where there will be like a day where all of a sudden none of my tweets are taking off i'm getting i'm getting no the algorithm is hating on me and in my head right i go through the same um the same thought process that probably most creators do which is like oh man everyone probably decided that they hate me like i probably did something nobody likes my stuff anymore and it's done i need to move on i need to figure right. something out but um but i noticed that once i walk away from the computer and honestly just don't go on twitter don't read other people's content don't do anything like that and i just have conversations with my friends which most of them are mm-hmm. founders if i call up a friend of mine and we'll talk for an hour we'll talk about their business 
Um, I'm an advisor for, for like five startups right now. Um, if I call one of them and, and sit in our call and they bring me a problem, there's usually a lesson I can pull out of that, that mm. I said, this is applicable to a mass audience. And then I can go on and I'll write about it. So right. not really. Um, I feel like if anything, it's more of burnout than it is. Uh, like a complete loss of inspiration. It's more of just me getting in my own head and being too online. Oh my God. That's, that's so unfiltered answer right there. It, it, like, right. I love it. I love it so much. And you, in, even in your couple of answers before you've pretty much mentioned about surrounding yourself with founders, right. And, or be part of these communities. So for people who are introverts, or they don't have that reach, what should they do to actually surround themselves with high quality people who are smarter than them? They're like five steps or 10 steps ahead of them. They kind of have the ability to like build a rapport with, with these founders or like, you know, make them friends, right? So how did you end up in that situation? And how would you, if you were to go back and say like, you know, some ex, ex founder to do the same, how would you advise to do them? Honestly, I think if you're an introvert, the internet is like a godsend. Like, because you can be on Twitter and you can be in Discord and you can be in these like Reddit communities, right? Um, where there are a lot of entrepreneurs. Granted, you don't know if everyone is is really who they say they are, but you honestly have to like kind of worry about that in real life too. You have to do your own like <laughs> diligence on anybody. But I really think joining like online communities, which is initially for anyone that's listening, but like how we bonded in the yes, first place exactly. is, is our love of online communities. Because, you know, I used to always think I was an extrovert. I think I'm a very extroverted introvert, but mm -hmm. the pandemic is really what catapulted me because I'm more comfortable interacting with people online. Like you won't really see me out at events. Like you won't really see me at networking events. Um, because they're really draining for me. Uh, like I get really tired. I don't really like it. I'd rather hang out with my friends than go to a networking event, but I can network and interact with people online, which I feel like is an introvert's dream. So mm -hmm. um, if you're introverted, but you wanna be a part of, of this kind of founder community, I say join online communities, find, find communities of founders, reach out to people one-on-one -on, -one on Twitter. Um, literally just ask people, Hey, like, I don't want anything from you, but would you be down to have a 15 minute phone call with me? Mm. So, so I can just like get to know you or like, what's one lesson that you have for me. And right. honestly, nine times out of 10, people will say yes. Like yeah. that's what I found is people are generally pretty friendly and want to help people and they want community so bad that they'll reply and they'll like want to interact with you, but you got to put in the work to just say like, Hey, I want this from you. Do you yeah. want, want to make it happen? I think an authentic ass. So, so a couple of takeaways uh, or just to summarize what you said or add to what you said. I'm like you. If if you put me in a in a hundred people conference or an event, I get so anxious. I'm like, I don't know what to talk about. My mouth will just shut down immediately. But what I realized, thanks to pandemic and thanks to these you know, online communities, I found that I have so much, I have very comfortable with talking to people like on the screen when I don't have anybody around me and I can sometimes dominate or I can, you know, piggyback, right? I feel for, for founders or for anybody who's just getting started, just try to take your shots as many, as much as you can. I think that's the best way. And you'll find an angle where you get very comfortable with it can be texting, it can be video, it can be audio, whatever the thing, the format it can be. I feel making the decision and making it intentional is really important. And I think just to echo your point, the other thing you said is 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 very interesting as well is you just have to ask. Yeah. <laughs> just, I mean, honestly, what do they say? 90% of it is just showing up. It's just asking. And I think it also comes from the, the thought of, Getting a no is very rarely personal. I used to take no's very personally. I used to think, oh, well, they just don't think I'm like good enough for them to talk to or whatever. And, and as I've gotten, I guess, more successful in my own career and have more people reaching out to me, 
I don't reply, it has nothing to do with the person. That, or, yeah. or if I say no, it has nothing to do with the person. It has everything to do with myself. Either something's going on in my life, either I'm burnt out, either mm -hmm. I am just like way too busy and I need to limit my like my mm -hmm. interactions, or I'm just like tired and I like it caught me at a bad time. But it, it like the most persistent people that I've found are the most successful. Like sometimes getting a no, it doesn't mean no forever. It means no for right now. Or if you don't get a response, it just means, okay, that person's just busy. I'll circle back and like. I think there is a very valid point people should realize. It's about expectation setting for yourself and for others, right? For sure. And when you have zero expectations and take your shot, it works. If it works, it feels like a miracle. If it is does if it doesn't work, it feels like an action you took and you learned a lesson. Maybe you should change a wording. For for example, if you're DMing people or emailing people cold. So there is always like have that learning hat. When you switch to that hat, pretty much everything you do, you know, amplifies and compounds. I, I truly believe in compound interest. That's how I've made pretty much my career by taking so many shots, just like shooting shot. This podcast, I, I, don't, I didn't reveal this outside. I've DM'd close to 300 people. That's awesome. And only you are the 37th guest, if I'm not wrong, on the show. So my success rate is so, if, if someone puts expectation on it, it feels so bad that out of 300, only 30 people, you know, said yes and made a conversation. But on the other end, you have to see like half glass full, 30 people, 30 incredible people, 30 plus incredible people said yes and gave their time to me. Some stranger who's asking I mean, that. I think about it. Like I look at your lineup and I'm like, that's a badass lineup for like, for a first time, like podcaster who's kind of like doing this now, right? It's an incredible lineup. And the fact that you were able to get those people, not just for a 10 minute phone call, but for an hour of their time. Yep is so freaking awesome and like that's the thing you gotta shoot your shot like it's as simple as that and even it's funny because it's like i adore you i think you're absolutely incredible it took you like three messages to get me to to actually commit to coming on the podcast and it had, like i said not a single thing to do with you it yeah. had nothing to do with you with like me not wanting to be here it had nothing to do with me not like loving the podcast or wanting to see you succeed it was solely because of me and the timing right. and stuff like that but it wouldn't have happened if you didn't follow up with me either because like i said the timing the busyness whatever yeah for whatever reason i think that time yeah i remember i think you were in mexico city something happened yeah, we changed I was everywhere. We were Radical for the last few months. I'm going to Mexico next week. I was in Greenland. I was in Japan. Like I'm, I'm all over the place. I've been home for like three weeks out of the last three months. So, so like, I don't really post, I post a little bit of that publicly, but like, I'm not going to post all about it. So, but it's as simple as that, like having this conversation now you're like, Oh, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Why Alex maybe didn't reply or wasn't as enthusiastic. Nothing to do exactly. with that. And so the other important thing, which is, you know, I know we're kind of on a rant here, but it's very important to uh, stress on this topic because if you just shoot one shot and you wait, you will get attached to that shot. So for me, you are one of 300. So I have 299 messages to go out. I'm very busy. I don't have the bandwidth to think about or judge Alex's reply or her you know, reply time, how much time she's taking to get back to me or why is she not replying to me? No bandwidth at all because I have another DM waiting for me, another guest to invite, another guest, another guest. Or I have, like, So get busy with taking shots. I think that's really important. If you just think that take one shot and that turns out to be a miracle, I, I feel like, you know, you're bound to failure for folks like listening or like they just... Burnout. I think even myself, I used to get burnout. Uh, I think this was back in 2018 when I when I took my maker journey. Uh, I, I built this startup, invested money, invested 18 months time. It even we didn't even launch the MVP. It was so bad that because, everybody has one. Everybody has. right. And my biggest complaint then is I took one shot and I went all in. 
that's it yeah. I, i have no other avocation or i was never busy so i think that that literally changed that fall actually really helped me to rise back and now i'm like okay who the heck it's okay if something doesn't work it's fine oh like i i wrote about this recently actually because i had this conversation um desensitize yourself to failure like that mm. the number one hack to success is desensitizing yourself to failure and desensitize yourself to messing up you're going to you're going to lose money like statistically speaking I've lost a lot of money on projects. I've also made a lot of money on other projects because that's the way this stuff works. You're sure. going to do something, you're going to hire the wrong person, you're going to spend too much money on a photo shoot or an MVP. It's just going to happen, okay? Mm. And the quicker that you can learn to just get over it and move on to the next thing and like the quicker response time you have, the higher your success, like the higher your chances of success really become. Mm I I love the word desensitize I think that's 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 the word we people should you have to develop a thick skin Yeah every <laughs> you can have like you know uh, light hearted you should be like you should dominate this area if you want to build a startup right because there is so much competition everybody's competing everybody's competing in their their own way you know you know attracting customers and all that so you have to be very authentic you so you as a founder uh have you ever wondered or talking about the thick skin have you ever felt like personal and how did you navigate from those personal losses or falls and become more thick skin you know okay. again honestly just repetition I and mean, like the first the first five times i did it it hurt and then by the time the sixth time rolled around i was like well I know I'm like I know I'm smart enough to make something happen. And then the 7th time it got a little better and then the 8th time it got a little bit better and then it just constantly got a little bit better. Kind of like the whole compounding thing that you were talking. About. Mm. Um like my first business was a nail polish product and it ended up getting replicated by overseas manufacturers and I was 20 I got I got a patent on it when I was like 22 um like now like 10 years ago which is crazy to think about but I uh, ended up getting vendor agreements with like Forever 21 and Urban Outfitters and Bed Bath and Beyond. I was so excited. It was my identity. It was my first business and then it got replicated and you could buy two of them for a dollar on AliExpress and mm. all my buyers pulled out. And mm. it was like it, at the time it felt like the worst thing that had ever happened to me. I was like I was crying. I was it was horrible and it took me genuinely like probably 2 years to really get over that. because wow. this was my baby like i thought that this was my future i thought that this was going to be like my end all be all to success and mm. you know before that there wasn't really a lot of things i was super proud of like i i never was really good in school i never got like really good grades like i i wasn't that kind of student but i was the girl that got a patent and got my product into stores before she even graduated college right mm. and um so it was something i was really proud of and all my friends knew about and and other people like i was talking to my entrepreneurship classes and they all knew about it so it felt really embarrassing mm. that it didn't work out the way that i wanted it to work out um but you know and then and then after that i started just doing the same thing working on smaller projects not spending as much time and money on them like literally giving myself a deadline and saying hey if by 3 months in this isn't working i'm just going to move on to something else like it's mm. not a big deal and now i'm at the point where honestly i'll try anything and if it doesn't work it just doesn't work like i i don't really spend too much time stressing about it but also it came from a lot of me just trusting my own abilities now and and upping my self confidence to say like i'm smart i'm capable i'm going to be successful I don't know if I'm at the success like I'm not the height of success that I want to be yet but I'll find the path there and any time that I waste on one thing is like inhibiting me to go after that path. So right. it's just better to just keep bopping along till you find the right thing. <laughs> I think as long as we play the long game we should be fine and we we never know we, we can't predict what will happen tomorrow, right? Like anything can happen tomorrow. You you yourself don't know when you started founder gigs i remember those that tweet and i we, we've had this conversations in dms about like freelancing you know sourcing freelancers and like designers 
Yeah. You you would have never imagined that Arlen get a they just come forward to like acquire Corner Geeks. That's I think yeah. that that is bonkers. A, a tweet to acquisition is bonkers. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Talk to me about that that whole journey. Your your yeah. expectation setting to like just tweeting out, having fun again, being micro small projects to five k MRR to like six months acquisition. Walk me through how you felt. Yeah. Um. So th- that was crazy. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll start there. That was that was a crazy ride. Um. So what happened is that, like I've said, I've worked with a ton of startup founders. Um. I'm friends with a lot of founders. A lot of founders trust me. It's probably part of like the authenticity thing. It's probably also part of like not really judgmental. Like I've seen it all. It's easy for me to talk through issues with people. And um, in over the course of like three days, I had uh, three different friends reach out to me and say, hey, Alex, this is like super vulnerable of me, but I'm running out of money. And um, my startup's not profitable yet. I don't want to shut down the business. I just need to make an extra $3,000 a month, let's say, um, to keep this going. And so that happened once, then it happened again, and then it happened a third time. And so eventually I said, you know, I don't know anything like that. They're like, do you know anyone that's hiring for uh, a part-time position or for like a, a small advisory role, like anyone that could just help supplement my income as I continue to build my business? Hmm. And I was like, no, but you know what? Let me tweet it. Okay. I probably had about 8,000 followers at the time. Um, maybe a little less, actually, maybe around 6,000. And I just tweeted it out. And all the tweet said is like, hey, um, a few of my friends, my founder friends, are looking for part time roles working for another startup. Does anyone know anyone that's hiring? And I got a ton of comments on that mm. post saying, no, but this is a great idea. Like, this is a great idea. Wow. Like, you should build this. And the time I was like, this isn't an idea. Like I, I wasn't thinking about it genuinely. I wasn't thinking mm-hmm. about it from the perspective of it being a business. Um, but I got all these comments from people and I said, all right, yeah, no, this is a good idea. So I, I went on to a uh, no code website and I built it. I literally built it that night. I stayed up till four o'clock in the morning. It was like September wow. 11th, two years, maybe a year, two years ago, two years ago now. It was yeah, literally 2021, September. Yeah. I remember it was September, September like 11th, 2021. And I stayed up until four o'clock in the morning. I built it. It was funny. My boyfriend was sitting on the couch next to me and he's just like, are you going to go to bed? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to try to launch this by tomorrow. And he's like, cool, right on. Like, go for it. Um, right. And then the next day I posted it, I got probably around like a hundred signups. So it didn't blow up at the time. And mm. all these people were commenting on it being like, wow, this is so impressive, Alex. And I was like, oh, thanks. Like, It was completely free. People could just sign up for it. I was DMing it to a ton of companies, trying to get them like building out this pool and it had Mm. a job board component. And then um, it just so happened that another gal on Twitter tweeted something out and said, hey, this is a vulnerable post, but I'm running out of money. Does anyone know where I can get a part-time job? And her post went viral. And all these people started commenting on her posting Hey, Alex Friedman just built this thing called Founder Gigs. Mm. Just built this thing called Founder Gigs. And so because they were commenting Founder Gigs on it, everyone that was looking at her viral post relating to it saw it. And then I ended up getting something like like 2,000 or 1,500 signups in the first 48 hours. Wow. Like it was nuts. Mm. And um I didn't know how to monetize it. (laughs) I I didn't know what to do with it. It was completely free for like the first month. So technically we didn't hit for 5k MRR the first month. We hit 5k MRR the first month that we started charging for it. Mm -hmm. And I have to give a a huge shout out um, to, his name is Ayush. He worked Mm -hmm. with me on Mm -hmm. this. He's absolutely incredible. I couldn't have, I couldn't imagine a better person to work with me on it. He was working with me on Howdy at the time. And then I said like, Mm -hmm. Hey, I just did this thing. This is nuts. Do you want to work on this with me? And he's like, yeah, let's do it. And he was all in right away. Um, So he was a huge part of it. But 
uh, we launched it. And then the next month I started asking people, okay, like, I don't know how to monetize this. Can you guys send me an ideas? And people started sending me an ideas, monetized it that month, got 5k wow. MRR. And then, um, and then, yeah, about six months later, uh, Arlen approached with the offer for acquisition. And at the time, which I've also posted very publicly, but one of my best friends had just been diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, honestly, I know that there's a business here. There obviously is, um, but I don't have the bandwidth. This is either going to die or I let it get acquired. Right. And so it, it seemed like the acquisition was the right step and it worked out. It worked out great. It's, it's like, it feels like a script. <laughs> It was nuts. It was one of those things that whenever I tell people, like, that's what I mean, where you just put stuff out and you yeah. never know what's going to hit. If someone asked me, and the thing is, I invest, which is so embarrassing to admit, because if someone said, hey, there's this product, would you invest in it? And it was founder gigs. I'd be like, no, like, I don't know if that's ever going to be like that. But it blew up and it came from a few factors. It came from, A, I already had the network. It was super easy for me to share it because I'm friends with a lot of founders. I know what founders want. I mm -hmm. like know what they experience. So I built it for a market that I knew so intimately and for a market that really trusted me. So it wasn't difficult for me to sell it to them. It wasn't difficult for me to get people to sign up because they're like, well, we love that. Like we, we know she has our best interests at heart. Here we go. So that was a huge part of it. And then just moving as quickly as possible. Those were mm -hmm. like, that was the two things that made it successful. Nothing else. I think, yeah, founder market fit is way important than product market fit. Uh, a lot, a lot many times founders underestimate because of the ideas being very sexy on paper, thinking that they might, you know, have or they have the edge of like launching that product and taking to the market because the, the market and product has that fit. But honestly, I feel, you know, they should all, everybody should start from, am I, I, I do I have a command in the niche or am I being celebrated or uh, recognized by people who I'm building for? I think that is really key. That question really defines a lot of things like confidence, like you said, ability to execute super fast because you won't have self-doubts or anything. You just like execute. You know this. It, it feels like you're going in a straight path. There is no zigzag or anything. It's like very clear, very crystal clear. Uh, yeah. That's a great point, by the way. I think I love the two. I, I was about to ask, like, what are the two biggest takeaways? Thankfully, like you just, you know, gave it away to me. Uh, yeah. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have any time for self-doubt, to be honest. I was just, yeah. I was too busy building it. I was too right. busy, like busy being like, Hey, this can help a lot of people that I consider to be my friends, obviously based off of all the comments that I got on that initial tweet. And right. so I just built it. It was crap. The first product wasn't good, but I just didn't right. overthink it. And then they, there's a big saying with product market fit where they say, doesn't really matter what the product looks like. doesn't really matter even totally how it functions. If mm -hmm. people need it bad enough, they're going to use it. And Founder Gigs version one was a great example of that. People needed it bad enough that it really didn't matter if it didn't work half the time. And it didn't really matter that it kind of didn't look that great. Like, mm -hmm. they wanted to use it. And one of the things I want to dive a little bit deeper about Founder Gigs is it's a marketplace, right? Uh, yeah. They're, they're, it's a job board for... Uh, founders who wants to like do part-time as well as at the same time for startup founders who offer these jobs so and marketplaces are freaking hard to build if you were to like do it again in a much better way uh, how would you do it and that advice will help people to like you know think about their marketplace ideas yeah um if i was to do it again what would i do i don't know if i would make it a marketplace oh, <laughs> I know. Another, another unfiltered. I, honestly, my biggest love it or hate it. I I don't know. I like authenticity is one of my my core values. So it's oh, kind of hard for me. like I probably wouldn't have made it a marketplace. I would have made it um, more of like a recruitment platform and figured mm. out a way to to charge people a percentage of their earnings. And then I would have partnered with companies in order to do it and acted as their recruiters. That's probably what I would have done instead. 
Mm-hmm. Um, that's actually what we tried to do and where we made the most amount of money. We did it. We had a like premium feature where we acted as recruiters for some of these companies. And um, we were able to charge people like $1,500 a month from doing that at one point. So that worked out great. 500 to $1,500 a month. Mm. Uh, if I was to do the marketplace again, I would have probably made sure that I had someone that was either a former recruiter and, and had access to more companies, or I would have, I would have figured out where to find uh, companies a little bit better, like how to position it for companies that wanted it more. Cause I really knew how to position it from the founder perspective. That wasn't hard at all. Right. It was a bit more difficult to um, position it from the company perspective. I think this is a, it's a very good point. Uh, a lot of marketplace ideas, founders have uh, a command or a domination in either side of it. It can be supply side or either demand side, and they fail to fill the other side. So it's a very good point of bringing an expert or someone who has who can fill that uh, gap. That's that's true. I think I never thought about it. I should probably like re- revisit my marketplace ideas. Uh, yeah, I think that's a very good point. I mean, that's why a lot of people move away from marketplaces is because they can only get one side of the marketplace to use it actively. So, I mean, that's why, I don't know, I'm not trying to be cynical by any means, but I'm like, if you can find a way to not make it a marketplace, I'm very supportive of that kind of business. And then if not, hire someone or find a partner that knows the other side of it and can recruit the other side of it really well. Oh my God. It's, yeah, I've tried a couple of times. Uh, but you know, I lost the interest even it, it wasn't fun. It was so, it was, it, it instantly becomes stressful because yeah. you have to really, you can see clearly a gap as a founder. If you're seeing gaps in your ideas, <laughs> it's less motivational, right? Like, you know, uh, but anyway, that's for, I think, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great advice. Let's talk about, uh, you've done, you know, so many shows podcasts on founders so i don't want to like revisit the same questions but i want to really talk about your content you know uh, the way you write viral tweets for example and uh the other thing i want to let's let's talk about that like talk about like virality yeah what makes uh you know a content piece viral in your opinion um i think that I talk like I'm, I talk like I talk in real life. Mm. Like that's a big part of it. Um, so when people read my tweets, I, I genuinely believe a lot of people view me as more of a friend than a content creator. And they also feel like they know me more than they know other content creators. Um, I don't, I don't ever want to be seen as like this unattainable figure for people to like that, like yeah, of course I like the respect. Like I like people knowing certain things about me or what I've accomplished, but that's never my like first primary goal. I'd mm. rather people view me as like the friend that's either like a peer mentor or building themselves in public. Like that's a big part of what I do. Mm. Um, so I think a big part of the virality is people just looking at my stuff and saying like, oh, that's Alex. Like, oh, like I can read that like I'm reading it from a friend or like someone's texting me. Mm. So you'll see at the beginning of a lot of my tweets, I'll I'll use informal language. I'll do mm. things like IDK oh, yeah. or, oh, I don't see it. I cuss. Um, yeah. I don't cuss a ton, but I cuss like enough where I feel like it has impact. Um, all that stuff, funny sure. enough, even though it is the way I talk, it's intentional. It's very intentional. Um, mm having like things that are misspelled in proper grammar, not yep. adding in all that stuff. It's intentional because it feels more personal than, than authoritative authoritarian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that that helps. I think the other thing that helps is um, stories like three different posts of mine consistently go viral. Uh, The first one is one-liners that are just easy and very relatable to a very wide audience. Those will go viral. 
The second one will be stories that relate back to my family or friends or conversations that I've had that have a lesson at the end of it. And then the third one are what I call like listicles. So really like I did one on Taylor Swift and just had five facts about her, um, about her tours. I did one about Costco and it was like five facts about mm -hmm. Costco. The way that I position that isn't like, hey, I am an expert in X, Y, and Z. And here is a list of five things that you need to know about Costco. Like I, I literally tweeted like, hey, I found out this cool thing about Costco. Here's five right. things that I learned. Like there's no sort of authority to it. It's like how I would talk at a dinner party as opposed to me being on stage giving a presentation. And I think that that, that plays into everything that I do. And that that is what allows those three types of, um, three pieces of content to go viral for. That's very counterintuitive. I have to tell you that, you know, if you, if you go ask, uh, or if you just, you know, scrape on the internet about how to make content viral yeah most of the suggestions are you should dominate or you should you should have an authority very less people say that i think authenticity beats authority period right i, I feel yeah. I, I think that's 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 key but the other thing is authority can be can work in short term like you know there are so many content creators that you know i don't want to name them but they're quite dominating in that, you know, particular niche, but they, they will be forgotten in the long run. People remember people who seem to be people, yeah. not some, someone else. Right. So that means you should be authentic. Uh, I love that. I love, I love, you know, I, I think for even I'm taking lessons about like, you know, the three things you mentioned, uh, at least you, I think we should all do a retro of ourselves, like the content we put out, what are some things that we really love and we shouldn't shy about. We should do double down on it and keep it going, right? Uh, like, sorry, um, not to cut you off, but based off of your point, I was actually thinking about this this morning. There are a lot of people on social media that they have a lot of followers, but I don't feel like anyone actually cares about them. I don't think anyone actually knows who they are. They just follow them because they get these information or they like what they teach, but like they don't have a real brand to them. And I'm a much bigger fan of people as brands and putting out content that feels like authentic to them. I don't need, like, here's the other thing that I've realized about authority as a whole is I don't need to tell people why I'm smart. I don't need to tell people that I'm accomplished. They can either, they can either derive that from the content that I put out or they don't. And it's not my responsibility to tell them otherwise, right? Yeah. I don't need to shove authority down anyone's throat. I just need to show up, be myself and put stuff out there and, right. and, you know, hope for the best. <laughs> I feel I think pandemic is is to blame because a lot many people have a lot of time and they don't know you know how to express themselves. So that's why I feel like in in between 2020 and 2023, if you really like do a good analysis of some of the folks who gain massive following list, they just they were very authoritative. But where are they now? And some of the folks I know. Uh, again, no one want to name name people, but they lost the touch of what they do authoritatively two years back. It's not 10 years. Guys, two years. They were authoritative in that niche two years, and now they disappeared because it's not a game you play for the long run. I think authenticity, being yourself, there is there is no game literally. You're being yourself. It's that expressing you know the lows and the highs, the things you go on. And I really appreciate you about, again, uh, going back to the intro, you just equally or even more shed light on the low lights, like mm -hmm. some of the failures, you know, take for age, age that th those tweets are very s simple and it's so relatable that a lot of many people, they just doubt themselves because they're at forties, they, they can the ability or time to build something from ground up, but helping them inspiring that truth itself is like you know it's so authentic to me i feel uh, those are the things that i i love about you and your content and coming to that point uh, why you think why do you think it's so important to highlight 
you know some of the downfalls or the failures of you know of anybody's journey because like a few reasons one i think it it makes it so more people don't give up i think if anything we need more entrepreneurs i love entrepreneurs i think that anyone that can have um like authority over their own lives and be able to support themselves whether that's a huge business whether that's a like a, a small business whether it's a solopreneurship i think is absolutely incredible and i think there's a lot of people um up until this point we have viewed entrepreneurship as being this like only for the one percent whether that's people that came from privileged backgrounds mm. or only for the one percent that made it we never highlight people that make $250,000 a year running a podcast or on Twitter or on social media, which $250,000 a year working for yourself in social media and making content is so freaking cool. So much better than working at a nine to five, in my opinion, in my world. Yeah, oh, 100%. And um, I think just like, like shedding light on those lows, it makes people feel less lonely. Like when I was going through this really hard time with my company, when my product just got replicated, I didn't even know who to turn to. I was so embarrassed. Mm. I, I like had only seen all these stories of all these 23 year olds. Like at the time, Evan Spiegel was building Snapchat and was the billionaire, billionaire 24 year old or however old he was, right? Like we see a lot of stories like that. And I don't think that they're encouraging. I think that they're encouraging maybe um, in small doses or to very specific type of people that want to like use that fuel to say like, oh, I want to be like that. So I'm going to put in the work. But I think it, it ends up being discouraging to almost everybody else in, in between. And mm. so um, I think highlighting that, I just, I like the idea of not of people not feeling like alone in their journeys and also like not wanting people to give up. I, mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest part of it is like, I've wanted to give up so many times, like so many times in my career and I didn't. And the only reason why I didn't is because I had mentors that told me that they believed in me and told me stories about their experiences. So if I can do that at scale, then hopefully that inspires a lot of other people to just keep going as long as they possibly can, if this is what they want to do with their lives. I feel, uh, you know, people becoming brands is one level and those, th the same people becoming safe houses for other people yeah. where they feel like, you know what, I can share with this set of group of people who are on the same level they had you know similar experiences failures or feelings before that they express pretty transparent i feel that's why i love the build in public moment uh, and I, again i think it's not for everybody you know it should come from within because someone else is doing you shouldn't do it if you genuinely feel like you want to be transparent on the internet go for it if you yeah. don't feel that way it's fine you know there are like I, I, that's that's another thing right I, in, to your point a lot of people they just do this stuff because other people are doing it that and that's the most inauthentic thing you can do right, right? Like, like you don't need to be vulnerable because you think it's what people want to hear I, like you post what feels most true to you and i mean i i just i don't think i would feel right posting about how much money i have or like really highlighting the <laughs> super like the accomplishments I've had um, mainly because there's a lot fewer of those than there are failures. There's, there's, there's a lot there's, and I think I honestly, and I don't think that's just true to me. I think that's true to every single entrepreneur, whether they will tell you that or not, there are a lot more strikeouts than there are hits and home runs. Yep. Right. And um, it's just like, what feels true to me if I'm going to share about my life is obviously there's going to be a bigger highlight on the downfalls than the others. Mm. Love. Love that. I think so many uh, tweet gems, you know, we're gathering in this conversation the past 50 minutes. I know we're going to, both of us are going to be writing after this, like <laughs> putting out all these bangers, all these viral tweets. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Uh, we should, we should name this podcast like banger content. <laughs> How to go? <laughs> How to write a banger tweet with Alex? So let's let's talk about uh, one of the things I really want to talk about is the vulnerability side of Alex. Yeah. And you know, one of the things I really love about you is again, 
going back to expressing yourself what are your feeling right talk to me about uh so what, one of the things uh that stuck to me and from the experience of you losing a friend mm-hmm. is you said that in one of your tweets i don't remember what but i actually bookmarked it the amount of grief is the amount of love and that is so uh for me it's it actually lifted a lot of burden because of the things i went through in my life mm-hmm. it shows that you really care and when you care so much it for some reason brings positivity into your life you're not really losing anybody or anything or you know even going back to these failures because you give a damn about People. the thing you care about right so so talk to me about erica um yeah the whole experience and the vulnerable side of alex man i love this question i'm i'm a little cut off guard because i've never people don't usually ask about grief it's it's interesting and i've noticed that since losing um i guess for for anyone that is listening that doesn't know i uh, erica was my best friend she got diagnosed last year with pancreatic cancer when she was 31 years old and 34 weeks pregnant um and then she passed away in february after 11 months so uh, a big part of why i sold my startup was that i wanted to be there with her um i pretty much gave up my life for the last year uh to be with her and it was it was it was really it was kind of a mind <laughs> it was kind of a mind fuck for lack of a better word because mm. i was blowing up on tiktok i just started my tiktok and reached mm. 50,000 followers in the first two months and then found out my best friend was dying Mm-hmm. and um i tried really hard to just keep going i sold my startup we didn't know she was terminal when she was first diagnosed um i actually found out that she was terminal on the same day that it was announced that founder gigs was getting acquired wow. so um i was sitting in my dad's garden it it was just announced that founder gigs was getting acquired it was on twitter it was arlen posted about it mm-hmm. and i was getting hundreds of congratulation messages and phone calls and texts and then maybe 30 minutes later erica called me and was like hey i just got out of the doctors and they said they that i have months to live wow. and i was at my dad's house and sitting in his garden and i was like simultaneously having a panic attack crying mm-hmm. my eyes out while getting all these congratulation messages and all i could think about in that moment is like i would trade it all like i would i would right. like anything that i could give in that moment i would have given it um if i could if i could change it yeah. and i didn't have that opportunity i didn't i didn't have that choice and so it made me start thinking a lot about these times in my life where You know, Erica and my last vacation together, I canceled it at the last moment. She still went with her husband um because I had like an investor meeting. And I I didn't I don't even remember what the investor meeting was, but obviously it was before she before she was diagnosed. Every everything after she was diagnosed was one thing, but there was a lot of instances that I could point to where I had picked work over being with her, and these are memories that I would have held on to now. Um and I, I expressed that to her before she died and she was like Alex like let that go like that she's like I don't even think about that like please don't be upset about that but it is one of those things that I look back on now um and so it, it genuinely changed my perspective around building businesses and the way I want to live my life and like where I want to put my time and energy um because like when you finally reach that point where like you don't have an option right mm. you're probably not going to pick work like i'm mm. just saying, like you're you're going to pick the memories and you're going to pick the people that you love um and i share that pretty openly online i shared a lot of that experience online not just because it was very like therapeutic to me um but because i felt like it was a lesson that a lot of people needed to understand like up until this last year i'm i'm i was like a workaholic like i i made a lot of sacrifices pretty pretty much all the time to work over being with friends and being with family i wouldn't go on family trips i wouldn't go home for the holidays because i'd be working mm. and now i would never do that again 
Like, mm. I just never do it again because I realize that's just not, it's just not worth it. And so it's a big reason why I share about that publicly because, um, A, I, I feel like she would want me to. And I think it's important for other people to reach that point. And it's, it's funny because I've actually had a few people ask me, they're like, Alex, do you ever feel nervous about posting these vulnerable things online? Do you ever feel like it's going to hurt your brand or hurt your reputation? Mm -hmm. And I can honestly tell you, A, no, I have no concern about that. But B, I've had some of the top like entrepreneurs, the top VCs, some of like the top, like people that have hundreds of thousands of followers that have Wikipedia pages that like people are dying to get calls and meetings with that have messaged me because of these, because of these tweets who've just said like, Hey, I have followed you or I've seen some of your tweets before, but I just need you to know people need to hear these things. And I really appreciate that you did that. And so it's just like a reminder that like, I feel like I'm doing the right thing because of authenticity and, and. And it's not forced. Like my messages, the tweets that I write about this stuff, that I write about grief, they're Mm -hmm. never forced. They're never because I think that they are like, oh, people need to learn this. It's because I experienced that pain and I don't want other people to experience it too. Hmm. You certainly changed the way I think about work. I'll tell you that. Because I think one one of your tweets were about you know spending time with your family prioritizing you know family friends and the important things to you over uh, the the things that you achieve in the long run like say work or building startups you know building audience and all that because i think i I read one of the tweets about you expressing about erica and i felt like you know what damn everything i don't i don't care about you know some of the things i do i have ambitions fine but i have a at that time, I have like a one-year-old who just yeah. took his first steps. And I sh- cherished so much that I started like, okay, spending more time intentionally with my wife. I talked to my mom and all that. I think you just want to say that you certainly changed uh, me uh, from that angle. Uh, I, I'm more of like a family person, but I always, like you, like you said, I think most of us who are ambitious, they just prioritize work because that's how it was drummed on us by many others for years right you have to prioritize like not to point blame on steve jobs he's a legend i love him to death he's 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 my indirect mentors but he prioritized work over family and like you said even in your previous answer we just compare even spiegel i'm i'm 34 he's 23 building a billion dollar business i'm a i'm a i'm a lost cause yeah steve he prioritized work, mass made a massive change. Probably that's the way. So I feel a lot many people should just ask these questions within, and whatever answer that comes out, live up to it. That's it. I feel sure. uh, not comparing with others, you know, and living your life is the biggest blessing you have. <laughs> we, so I, every day that we wake up healthy and, and like healthy and everyone around you is healthy is like a blessing. And I don't think you realize that until someone close to you or until you get sick, right? They, mm-hmm. There's a saying where it's like, um, a, a, like a healthy person has a thousand wishes, a yep. sick person has one. And then yep. like, you know, unless you're prioritizing that stuff, but it's, it's not just about um, prioritizing family and friends and all that over work. It's about also not bringing your work home with you. Right. Like Mm. I have this habit or I did have this habit of if something happened to me and I would go and be with Erica, um, I would I would be so busy being upset about this thing Mm. that happened. Right. Like about someone being mean to me on Twitter or being rude or whatever. And so even though I technically wasn't working when I was with her, I wasn't being present because I was thinking about this thing that that doesn't even matter. That was like so irrelevant that I don't even remember what it was today. Right. Um, so I think that's a big part of it too. It's just if if you're going to work and if you're going to be a present, if you're going to be a figure online, um, learn how to separate those things and not bring it home so you can be as present as possible and actually like like show the people around you that you care and you prioritize them. Yeah. 
and i think uh, adversity changes a lot of things that's what that's that's the transformational thing i was talking about in the beginning you know when i was like introducing you or even just having that pre chat is because now you don't give a fuck about anything <laughs> when you when you lose something that is really important yeah. everything else will fade away right you just said about you know trading anything that you have right now for you know bringing erica back right so i think that is for ambitious people i feel um, i i think ambitious people should face adversity to an extreme level because yeah. we will kind of take that fall or that loss and convert into something again to your point will become so thick that who cares like all the results and nothing will be like you know what it's so funny i love that you said that because i've never thought about it that way but it's so true like i had the worst thing that one of the worst things that could have ever happened to me happened to me at a very young age mm-hmm. and anything that happens now i'm kind of like all right <laughs> i'll figure it out like like i'll figure it out it doesn't it doesn't really matter cuz nothing will hurt as much as that and i made it through that doing pretty right. okay so yeah i've never thought about it like that but i like that. no <laughs> like, I, yeah i think that's why i feel uh that's the one that's one thing i should i think people should talk a lot about you know how adversity shaped them yeah you know and turned them into even better make them better and you know i think that teachings are very important uh i know we are like running out you know more more than the time we've been booked for but one more question i i've i have like so many questions but <laughs> one of the things i want to kind of ask about you is how did you recover from the loss i i have it yeah to be honest i i don't i don't think i ever will Um I think it's one of those things that like you wake up every day and you just hope that it's going to hurt a little bit less and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Mm. And um I mean a big part of taking the sabbatical is to try to to do that to try to just appreciate the life that I have, the life I've been given. Mm. Um the fact that I am alive. <laughs> like a, a lot of the appreciation for that um is kind of what inspired me to take this break now. But no, I mean I I still think about Erica 24/7. Like she just never leaves my mind, which is why people ask me like how do you talk to someone that's grieving? And I'm like ask about the person. Like I love that you asked about her and weren't afraid to ask about her because a lot of people are afraid to ask someone that's grieving mm. about the person that they're grieving. And right. they're like oh well i'm worried that if i bring them up um they're going to get upset i can guarantee that person is thinking about them 24/7 yeah. like yeah <laughs> and it's just that's the way grief works and right. i think it'll be one of those things that probably i'll deal with for the rest of my life because like that's the person that she was and um like I'm really grateful. At the end of the day, I'm really grateful that I got to have a friendship and a relationship like that once in my life. Right? Like I, I the reason the reason I asked that question about, you know, that's that's how I want to end this podcast episode is because uh I'm more of like a half glass full guy <laughs> for life. And even for you, I'm sure and correct me if I'm not, you know, if I'm wrong, after this call you would probably remiss those moments you had with erica than the moments you didn't have with her which is in the future yeah. you you must have gotten like you open photos or like text messages or on like you will you will probably like be in that mode than you know the last side so because i've kind of not to your extent but you know when people ask about my failures i'm like damn i get i get the opportunity to tell them about yeah. the things i did which are more important than the the things that didn't work out so i view it that way that's why you know i kind of brought it up but it's yeah i think you know more strength to you alex you know i i feel you will go places for sure uh people would be stupid to not predict that and uh i'm i'm, I'm so fortunate and grateful to call you as a friend and i had you know i had a blast <laughs> 
uh, talking to you as always. We should do this more, probably I, like, you know. <laughs> Can we just make this recurring? I don't even care if it's recorded or not. I just want to <laughs> put on my calendar once a month. We'll do a catch up. But yeah. either way, I'm really grateful that you asked me to be here and to chat. And thank you for, thank you for the very authentic questions and the very um, thought out. I loved I loved the questions. No, you know, you you. I think the guests make you know people like us open up more. So I had I had like I usually get nervous you know in front of my guests because I ask these weird questions. Sometimes they feel like you know, but with you I'm like you know what I'm talking to a friend. Let's we're homies. Anything that would probably be like yeah. <laughs> uh, but Alex appreciate you grateful for you your presence in our life you know in so many other people's life you certainly changed to me uh, about many things so i love you and do your thing you're amazing you're 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 blessed uh, you're full i just want to tell you that you are so full love you, and you make other people full so uh, on that note i just want to you know thank our you know listeners for giving us the time and attention you know you are the reason we do these conversations openly authentically you energize us you fuel us uh, stay tuned for more more people like alex and probably like we'll bring you some other time you know for round 2 <laughs> yeah and i'll send you will it won't take three messages to get me here <laughs> <laughs> it's okay <laughs> i forgive you <laughs> all right guys that's it for this episode stay tuned uh, thank you Thank you. Cheers.